Tracy, here we are. <laughs> Having a lovely chai tea. <laughs> <laughs> this is the chai club. Um, it's really interesting to talk to you and get your perspective broadly about how we can create sustainable change, but also support women to take that first step. And we often hear, actually, I was on the phone to a woman this morning, and she's saying that she is a technical expert. She knows that she's ready for that next step, but she's been in her industry and her sector for 20 years. And she said, I've worked so hard, I don't actually have time mm. to create a network and I have no idea how to take that step out. And I'm sure you hear from many women wanting to know how, or even the women that don't actually get to and they just stop themselves. What do you think we can do to support women in that sort of situation? I really feel for her and Women in Leadership Australia does so many wonderful programs to assist women in that circumstance exactly. There are two things going on here. One are the external structures holding women back. We need to break down those barriers. Certainly that takes a long time. But also we need to give women the confidence to take that step because we're all beset to varying degrees. Good girl syndrome, imposter syndrome and what used to be called the confidence code. That lack of confidence that builds up over a lifetime you know, aided and abetted by external factors like the fact that we do the vast bulk of unpaid work in society so we don't have the time to go out and do that networking at night or wherever it takes place. Used to be the golf course, now a lot of it's with these cycling groups with men. You know, we seem to be still locked out of those mixed gender networking events where the powerful decisions tend to really the take place. The real business happens. The real business happens. So I think we need to work at, at both levels and realise it's not us. I say to a lot of the young women I mentor, it's not you. You know, seek out mentors in the workplace, seek out sponsors, find out about the right time to take that step up, have the confidence in yourself, but understand that it's not something intrinsically wrong with you, it's the way that the workplace has been structured. Yeah, that idea of being the good girl, it's a really hard one because mm. I hear over and over again that they've worked so hard, they are good, they're the ones that get, they get all the delegated work, mm. they get the things that are thrown over because nobody else can pick it up and it stops them from being able to see what else is around. How it's do so we, true. yeah, what do we do about that? Well you become in a pattern of behaviour about being the good girl. You know, being the glue in others' conversations, doing the volunteer tasks that are required yes. around the office. I'll do it. Exactly, putting your hand up, that old idea of doing twice the amount of work as men. Particularly part time. If I'm part time, then well, I'll right. work full time and you don't have to pay me for the extra two days. Yeah, <laughs> and we're seeing a lot of that with job sharing and women in part time freelance and casual roles that they're doing full time hours, some of it from home, and not getting paid that rate and missing out on that career trajectory as well. Exactly. What advice do you give to women like that? Because you've been working in this area for a long time. What I see makes a real shift, and that's why I'm so proud of the network that we've created, is actually being in the room, like what you said before, so they can see that it's not them, they haven't done anything wrong, mm. but they can connect with other women from other sectors with a very different journey and share what their challenges have been, but even more importantly, what they've been able to learn around the enablers. And I see huge shifts, you know, women, I was running a program earlier this week, and one of the women, as she left, she said, it's been such a relief to hear the stories that are happening elsewhere, and to actually be able to say, I'm doing pretty well, and I didn't realise I was, and then all of a sudden it was, the confidence gap was starting to shrink because she said people were actually asking me for my opinion and asking me about my experiences. I didn't think I had anything to offer. In fact, I didn't even want to come to this program because I thought I'm not at the right level. So it's That's bridging so that gap. Full. It is, and sharing experiences and, like you say, more importantly, strategies. Yeah. And also to be able to define the language to give words to what is happening around you. Because yes. I know that you have some incredible speakers from a broad range of backgrounds and industries that 
speak at your events and it's run your workshops. Like you. Oh, thank you. That's very generous. But you know, to be able to define what's happening in your yeah. workplace, not only do you know you're not alone, but you can put your finger on it and say, "Oh, hang on, I know what that person's doing to me. I won't yes. put up with that. That's Absolutely. unacceptable." Absolutely. And I think it's also when we call them the situational senses that you get a good understanding of what else is happening outside of your sector. So if you can pick up, and I like the idea, you know, this language is so important. Mm. So if we can pick up, be aware of the language that we're using, but also understanding what other people are seeing and doing mm. around us and bring that as part of the stories that we tell, all of a sudden we're seen as more of a, a, a I suppose, leadership presence becomes, it starts to expand mm. rather than I'm the hard worker, I don't have time to look up and see, mm. bringing those stories. And I think s listening to women like you and the aspirational leaders from all different sectors, it creates a, a common language and I suppose a, a focus on what is happening rather than what isn't. That's really wise. And it also gives a sense of collective action, of a sisterhood. Yes. That doesn't necessarily mean we all take to the streets together. If you so choose to do, that, that, that's a great thing. But we can collectively join together as women at events or in workshops or across industries or within our own workplaces. And that gives us a sense of solidarity, that we're not alone, that we can move forward together, that someone else has our backs. That's why we need male allies in the workplace as well. Yeah. Because I've known of a lot of circumstances with the young women I mentor where they've found other men in the workplace who've gone with them to talk to the managers about problems that are happening. And with that group action, they've been able to affect changes because it's not just one person going up. It's terrifying going Absolutely. up and talking about this when you're on your own. Absolutely. And I think that dual process, so having the network with women, mm. and often women will say, you know, we, we need to have programs like this with men. We need to keep this space for us, but we also need to bring the men in the room. And I think that can be the challenge as well of getting I suppose, I don't know, working out a pathway, how we can actually get those men sitting down, having the conversations that we need to have. Have you seen any of those shifts? Yes, and do you know what I reckon the answer is there? Storytelling. We've had data for years and years and years, and we need the data, that's important. But what I've seen with the Me Too movement, where I've seen those light bulb moments, those epiphanies in men who I never thought would come on board with this cause, is when one of their colleagues has told them a story about being sexually harassed in the workplace and all of a sudden they've gone, oh my goodness, I've worked with this person for 20 years, I had no idea they went through that. This is happening around me and I never had my eyes open to it and now I'm going to do something about it. That's why storytelling and women sharing their experiences is so important. Mm. And I think storytelling about what is working as well, so that, and that's often what we do in our programs to support women to actually be able to articulate the stories that are actually going to make a difference mm. as well. And having the confidence to find those words too, which I suppose is very much in the area that you focus on as well, because women are, are so externally focused. Mm. They're being judged on what they say, how they look, how they present. What sort of support do you give for women in that arena? <laughs> it's really difficult because we have been viewed as decorative rather than operative in society for centuries. You know, this expectation of the corporate look that we're both sporting today to be taken seriously. So I think part of it is talking about this, breaking it down, understanding that it's an unreasonable expectation on women. And to watch your TED talk. Oh, thank you, that's lovely. <laughs> and to strip that stuff back and yeah. say, look, I'm actually a very capable person in the workplace and I should be judged on that alone. Yeah. And again, you know, giving the men the language to understand that it's not okay to comment on the way a woman appears in the workplace. Okay. And it's not political correctness gone mad, it's that a woman wants to be valued for what she does in the workplace rather than how she appears. Which, coming back to that point about the sisterhood, it's changed so much in its language. When I started working in the gender diversity field, probably about 10 years ago, we used to teach women how to speak like men, you know, because yes. you won't be heard. <laughs> but now knowing that everyone is so different and having that inclusive awareness that we are, it's not them and us, it's actually we're all different, and I suppose it's actually understanding what your voice is too. 
and also the different models of leadership. And I know that you teach this uh, really profoundly, the fact that it doesn't have to be the old fashioned hierarchical male model of leadership. Women, you know, bring different things to leadership and that diversity of role modelling is incredibly important as well. Yes, very true. And I think it is about, and that's why I love the symposiums or being able to really see different styles in front mm. of you, share their story. And some of the activities that we do is actually get women to get up and actually to say, in one minute, share your story. And the first thing they'll say is, I don't have anything to share, I don't have anything to say. But I think it's those stories that become so powerful and so close to their heart, this is what they see and do. And I think having that confidence to be able to share and listen is going to make a difference as well. Definitely, you've just reminded me of something that I've seen over the last 30 years that I've been doing media and presentation training. Um, I've always noticed that men are much more confident with sharing their stories and having their voice heard, whereas I've actually trained women who've said, I feel like I don't deserve to have a voice. And then you do a whole day with them and you realise that something has happened in their past. Now that could be domestic violence, it could be something when they are a child, when they've been told to shut up. And all of a sudden they realise, you know, they feel that they don't deserve to be heard. And it's lovely to be able to train them that they do deserve to have a voice and to see them giving a wonderful speech at the end of the day and to own the stage. Often when you see women get up on stage at the start, they try to take up as little space as possible and go into themselves, whereas we teach them through outspoken women to stand their ground, and that's incredibly powerful. Isn't that wonderful? We always see when people start the day, the program, you can sort of see the ones that are walking in quite confidently, and they own it, and the others that are sort of tentatively watching, but progress over the day mm. and start seeing that they've actually got something to share. But if, I suppose the challenge is, it's actually giving them the opportunity in the workplace as well so that they can be heard mm. and to create that championing of each other as well. I think that network connection is really important. Mm. So the networks that you're involved with, what do you how do you how do you see a startup? You know, if we were to say that I want to create a, a network at work, what do you think is important to do in terms of those first steps? I think it's important to find like-minded people in the workplace to start that. Because if you start with a group and you start it positively, then it will have the right atmosphere and, and it will be supported by the workplace. Um, I, I just think do it, you know, just I think it. go out and do it. And I also think don't exclude men. Certainly we need to have women's only spaces, you know, to, to tell some of our stories. But we, men need to hear these stories as well, otherwise we risk becoming an echo chamber. Networking with each other is important to create girls clubs to equal the boys clubs certainly, but we need men to hear the challenges that we face so they can understand that if they're in executive roles to be able to change things to benefit everybody. Yeah. Yeah.